Any of you that went to Bible school probably know this message. Trust in God, he knows what's best for you, right? Many families believe in this and raise their children to believe in it too. This was especially true for the various missionaries spread across the globe throughout the 70s and 80s, all under the umbrella of the children of God. The communities seemed to make the members and their children happy. They'd witness wherever they went, singing and dancing for tourists while telling them all about what peace and joy God and Jesus brought them. And as leaders recognized, what person would refuse a little child asking them to pray together? And plenty of people did join, young adults looking to capture the world for Jesus, who were growing up in an environment all about free love really identified with the children of God's messaging. This free love, or as it was in the community, sharing of partners, led to plenty of pregnancies and subsequently, plenty of children as members. To reach out to these children, the leader, David Berg, was clever. He used comic books and stories to talk to his followers. They called him father, grandfather, or Moses Berg too. He was an enigma, the man behind the curtain, and his word wasn't just law, it was the word of God. Would you dare disobey the word of God? What about when God's word in comic book form illustrated David Burke going to heaven and sleeping with a deceased 17 year old member? What about when the word of God commanded women in the community to act as bait, going to bars and seducing men, bringing them back to their homes and enticing them to join? And what about when the word of God allegedly commanded the children of the community to strip and to send videos of it happening to David himself? Would you still obey his word then? Hello and welcome to Dark Dives. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be taking a look at the Children of God cult. It's taken multiple different forms over the years and there've been varying accounts of what actually goes on behind the community's closed doors. So today we're gonna take a peek behind those doors, shall we? David Brandt Berg, the founder of the Children of God was a former Christian Missionary Alliance pastor that got his start by leading a Teens for Christ group in the late 1960s. Other sources say it was called Teen Challenge, but the message is essentially the same. Hippies and outcasts were welcome to leave the world behind and join David, living for God and singing songs. These young people looking for direction and freedom would gladly tell strangers about the love of Jesus and how to better love one another in the free love movement at that time. Free love, if you're not aware, was formed to basically keep the government out of sex lives and matters of marriage, birth control, and things of that nature. As it expanded, it basically became a movement that made sex before marriage more socially acceptable and came to encompass love and sex between all people and all genders. It pushed against rigid traditional views on these matters and David Berg, despite having a community based in religion, embraced those values. This is one thing that's really important to understand about Berg. When we hear the word cult, we often assume that it's a restrictive lifestyle and the goal is to entrap you in a religious, traditional ideal that ultimately strips you of your identity, power, individualism, those kinds of things. However, in many cults, certainly most of the ones that I've ever researched, that doesn't happen right away. It's not as if recruiters say, hey, come live in our communities and we'll dictate what you wear, micromanage every decision you make and force you to sleep with people whether you like it or not. Instead, they enticed members with the promise of salvation. And by joining, you'll be able to witness and win more souls for Jesus, leaving the world behind. One member, Sylvia, joined when she was 22 years old. She wanted to travel and eventually ended up in Costa Rica where she met her husband. 
They had two children and moved back to England before the Children of God group told the couple to go back to Costa Rica and as Sylvia put it, capture it for Jesus. This is yet another important part of cults to keep in mind, the isolation. Sylvia had her husband and children, absolutely, but she left essentially everything else behind for what she believed to be a godly mission. And should things go wrong, she had nowhere else to go. Early on though, Sylvia, her husband, and her daughters, Shuli and Debbie, seemed happy. The house they lived in was small with 30 people stuffed in it, and the leaders were a bit rude, but Sylvia thought she was bringing up her children the best way possible. The name Children of God was fitting, as it turned out, because there were so many children members. Better yet, David Berg seemed to be a fatherly leader. Although he wasn't present in the day-to-day -day lives of the community members, he requested that they send him videos of the going-ons in the group. In exchange, he didn't send dense books with difficult to decipher language. No, he communicated through comic books. Moses David, as he liked to be called, sent out Mo letters that explained his religious teachings in a way that children and adults could understand and enjoy, but they weren't just for fun. These comics were inspired by God. They were treated like biblical teachings to many. And in them, aside from how to obey God, was one very important message. The end was near. According to Moses David, also called father or grandfather, the world was coming to an end in 1993. Although we obviously know that that is not accurate in the slightest now, for the children of God at the time, it meant that the end was nigh and they needed to save more people, evangelize, and rescue others for Jesus by any means necessary. Luckily for them, David had just the way. Flirty fishing. Can you get what this means? All the angels in heaven above, right when there's so and trigger warning here, from this part out, the entirety of this episode will discuss sexual abuse of women and minors. So if you're not in the headspace or anything to really hear about that, just know that this is kind of where the episode's gonna end for you. And for the rest of us, let's continue. So flirty fishing was, and there's really no other way to say this, when women in the community were encouraged to go to bars, pick up men, take them home and convert them. According to Sylvia, the brainwashing around this time, the mid 70s was so severe that the women in the Children of God cult truly didn't see it that way at all. Instead, they viewed flirty fishing as a way to use their gifts, AKA their physical appearance for God. Plus it was supposedly biblically based with the Matthew 4:19 biblical verse saying this, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And of course, I'm not religious or a biblical expert by any stretch of the imagination, but it literally does not refer in any way to seduce them and have married women go out there, go to bars and win some souls for Jesus. It's just all very strange to me. And I get it that free love was all the rage around the time and making sex outside of marriage more normalized was important. And if these women were single or in open relationships and both parties were consenting and willing, then go for it, you do you. I literally could not care. However, the women in the Children of God cult were receiving comic books from Mo David about why they should do this, which to me, that's strange. So let me reiterate just a little more simply. They believed that they were getting instructions from a man of God to go seduce and make disciples of random men that they find at bars. According to the 1994 documentary, Children of God, primarily featuring Sylvia, one of the biggest reasons this ended was because of the AIDS scare. It's not as if David suddenly realized, wow, this is a very fucked up thing to do that I'm demanding. It was because of the AIDS epidemic. Wired actually makes a really good point when they call this love bombing, which is a classic early warning sign of a potentially abusive relationship. A partner may seem loving, caring, fantastic, all of those things, but it's all just a carefully constructed facade. So when their true self comes out, someone may say, they're not really like this, or, but they can be so sweet and make excuses for really nasty behavior. The women in the Children of God cult were being used as bait to lure people into a cult and David himself was the fisherman. Unsurprisingly, this attitude permeated the community itself too in the concept of sharing. The granddaughter of David Berg, Faith Jones, explained to NPR that women were ordered to share themselves with the men of the group, whether they wanted to or not, and whether they were married or not. This kind of pressure just is not consensual sex, it's rape. It was both horrific for the women to have endured this and for the children to witness it too. Sylvia's children said that even at a young age, they understood that their mother was allowing men from the community into the marital bed. They felt it was perverted, gross, and it damaged the relationship between them. The children of God was supposed to be saving souls and teaching kids to evangelize. 
but as time wore on, it kind of felt more like one big non-consensual sex community preaching about how the end was near. According to Faith, she doesn't even remember a time she didn't know about sex and sharing women was on its schedule. In one sense, the isolated devotion aspect, Faith grew up like a nun, but as she put it, she grew up like a nun, except where there was a lot of sex involved. However, the cult wouldn't remain unknown and isolated for long. In the mid 1970s, the children of God were called out after they tried to file as a nonprofit, you know, a real church. And that did not go over well as you might expect. Attorney General Louis Lefkowitz accused them of brainwashing, sexual abuse, and involuntary confinement of youths. Drug use, hypnosis, and censoring mail and phone calls were also among the list of things people said the cult had done to better keep their members brainwashed and isolated. And this was just a few years before the tragedy at Jonestown, one of the most well-known cults to date. People were just getting started to become more aware of the damage communities like these could really do, but at the time, hands were tied. Lefkowitz explained, Despite the facts outlined, no direct action can be undertaken at this time against the children of God because the constitutional protection of the First Amendment. Continuing attention, however, should be paid to its activities. So basically what he was saying was, yeah, we know this place is really shady and probably absolutely a dangerous cult, but they have the freedom of speech and religion and we're going to leave it there because we can't do anything about that. And truthfully, this baffles me. The right to have your own religion and practice freedom of speech should never equate to the right to sexually abuse somebody. But see, by this point, the children of God wasn't just teaching that adults should all share their bodies. They wanted to share children's bodies too. Now, normally I don't place ad breaks this close, like in the middle, I usually try to put them towards the end, but I'm telling you the next section really just freaks me the fuck out a lot. So I'm gonna go ahead and place a sponsor here. You guys get, you know, what, two to three minutes to hang out, listen to the ads and decide, do I really wanna hear this next section or not? Your call either way, I'm gonna go ahead and place the ads here because you're welcome in advance. This new year, you've got goals and Factor is here to help you achieve each and every one of them. Fuel up fast with ready to eat, nutritious meals delivered straight to your door, leaving you time and energy to tackle everything on your 2023 to-do list. Achieve and maintain your goals better with Factor. Get America's number one ready to eat meal kit and start saving time, eating better and living your best year yet. With Factor, you can skip the trip to the grocery store and skip the chopping, prepping and cleanup too. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. And no matter your lifestyle, Factor has delicious flavor packed meals to help you live it to the fullest with keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie and protein plus options. I've been really cutting back on the types of protein I've been eating in particular beef. But that being said, they do have one meal that I absolutely go feral for. It's called like the jalapeno popper burger, I think is what it's called. And it's amazing. It's not on the menu every single week, but it pops up like every two, three weeks. And it is absolutely amazing. They've had it on their menu for years. And I assure you it is delightful. So head on over to factormeals.com slash darkdives50 and use code darkdives50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code darkdives50 at factormeals.com slash darkdives50 to get 50% off your first box. I'm also gonna go ahead and have this episode sponsored by me, although this is not really a sponsorship. I just wanna give y'all some information. In case you don't know, every Thursday nights, it's somewhere between like five to 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, um, I do a stream with a whole bunch of really great folks over in kind of the left-leaning political community. It's called The Leftist Mafia. We stream it on Twitch and on YouTube. And if you ever wanna check that out, feel free to head over to my Twitch, twitch.tv slash The Illuminati, or my second YouTube channel, which is Illuminati. It's pretty much spelled the same way as this, but it just has a little T-E-A at the end instead. Now, once you involve children who can't consent to sexual activities, I don't really give a fuck what your religion says about it. It's twisted and it's vile. And not only were children being exposed to strip teases within the community, but they were pressured to do them as well. Everything we did was controlled because grandpa said so in the letters. Everything he said in the letters was followed. Absolutely everything. Like for example, how to wipe your butt, Seriously, three sheets of toilet paper and no more because it's a waste of the Lord's money. Miriam Padilla, Sylvia's daughter, said that she was only 14 years old when she joined in because she felt that she had absolutely no choice in the matter. 
In the documentary, she explained that she felt she couldn't do anything because she was only a child and that the first time she was asked to strip, she realized, quote, these people could do anything to me. Worse yet, remember how David Berg wanted everything happening in his cult to be filmed and sent to him? Well, naturally, of course, that included children stripping on camera for him. I very obviously will not show footage of this or link to it because it's disturbing, but in 1994, the documentary Children of God does have the clips of the little kids, one of them looking to be about six years or so stripping and dancing with their face blurred, but it's happening all the same. And while I get that believing only one side of the story or one narrative isn't typically how anybody should approach an investigation or scandal, I really don't see any reason why these videos should exist in the first place. There is zero good reasoning in the world as to why Berg should have been receiving what is by definition child pornography. Berg didn't just receive CP though. He also seemed to normalize it and distribute it within the cult in one of the most disgusting ways imaginable. The family that I've been following in this 1994 documentary, the Padilla family, went through an extremely difficult time when one of the eldest daughters, 17-year-old Shuli Padilla, became gravely ill. You see, because my parents were brainwashed at this point as well, they believed that, you know, God could have healed her, but, you know, if, if but, but the Lord decided to take her home because she was too good for this world and all this, you know? I think she had a lot to offer to this world and I feel very cheated and I wish she were alive today. It was likely lupus and as the cult guilt-tripped and discouraged members that took medicine, her condition deteriorated. She stopped taking her treatment and died not long afterward. According to her mother, Sylvia, the cult wasn't really there for them. The most they got was a sympathy card. Sylvia guessed it was because they were embarrassed. No one is supposed to die in the children of God and they didn't want to acknowledge the loss. But there was one unforgettable response from Berg himself. He claimed that he greeted her in heaven in a dream and then slept with her. And that's right, Berg told his followers that he slept with a teenager who had referred to him as grandpa, had the scene illustrated and sent it to the other Children of God members. Shelley's sisters were justifiably disgusted. This was supposed to be a messenger of God claiming to have slept with a 17 year old that had recently fucking died. And I just, I have to ask, though I know I will get no valid answer. What was the actual fucking purpose of this? It is disgusting and upsetting. And the more I think about it, the angrier I get. While actually having sex with children was supposedly discouraged, one of the letters Berg and his wife sent to his followers in 1985 reads as follows. I think as children, before the girls start menstruating and the boys start seminating, that's their opportunity to have all the sex they want. For the sake of potential problems with the system, we've set a rule for our girls that they can't have sexual intercourse after their period until they're 15 to avoid having babies so young that they are shocking the doctors and authorities. And just excuse me while I fucking vomit. I feel like I need to take a shower to wash off that quote. It doesn't even seem like anyone else in the cult questioned this, judging by the documentaries retelling of events. And while you'd like to hope that this story, as well as the photographic CP Berg distributed in his Mo letters would give these followers pause, they were brainwashed into accepting it. They were merely sharing gifts and encouraging children to do the same. And it seems like they didn't even really view their bodies as their own. Faith Jones, Berg's granddaughter, said that it was in fact the principle of self-ownership that helped her break free from the children of God. Kids were brought up with harsh corporal punishment from a very young age and taught to say yes and only yes. This was exemplified in a horrifying song that the children would sing called Do It Cause Daddy Says So. Some letters by Berg called the girl who wouldn't supposedly, quote, blasted public humiliation for this woman who wouldn't submit to a particular type of sex with one of the leaders. It wasn't as if all of this happened overnight either. Berg cultivated this community and raised a generation of followers that weren't going to question him, believed in his teachings and didn't have a life outside of the cult. However, David Berg was already in his seventies by this point and the end times he talked about in 1993 were coming. So what about when life outside Berg became a reality? In a way, Berg was right about the end times being in 1993, only it wasn't for the rest of the world, but just for himself. After that 1974 article warning of the group, the children of God effectively abandoned the United States. 
They eventually changed their name to The Family and began building themselves back up in the early to mid 1990s, evangelizing at colleges, YMCAs, and juvenile homes. According to the LA Times, several hundred members did this in Southern California, all while hiding their strange history. Quote, the group asked to be judged by its current actions, not by its past, but some former members say things haven't really changed. Personally, I don't see this as a matter of a cult centered around sex. It's a lot worse than that, honestly. This is a cult that has normalized child abuse, pedophilia, rape, treating its members as disposable objects, and much more. Framing this as some remnant of the free love movement does a disservice to those that suffered at the hands of the leaders and fellow members. I'm not saying people can't change, but even if this cult did want to move forward and abandon old beliefs, which I'm not convinced is the case, you can't do that without acknowledging the damage you've done either. And by the sounds of it, these evangelists just said, yeah, haha, we're way too focused on sex, but we're better now, and just left it at that. One of the reasons I don't believe that these policies had anything to do whatsoever with ethics is because a family spokesperson said that sex was apparently distracting teens from their studying and missionary work. Yet a 1991 letter from Berg said that it was all because the system was too freaked out by this. And gee, I wonder why. Unsurprisingly, some of the worst accusations come from within Berg's own family, with Berg's biological granddaughter saying he, quote, started having sex with me, not penetration, but everything else when I was five. But as this information was slowly revealed and these damning accusations were made, one question on people's minds was why? Who the fuck would do something like this? Was Berg just a devil disguised as a messenger from God? Well, not exactly, apparently. By the LA Times account, Berg was molested by his nanny when he was young and his cousin allegedly committed incest when he was only seven. Therefore, Berg normalizing sex with kids may have been his own attempt to normalize his experience as a kid. Not that that's any excuse, but it might serve as some sort of explanation at the bare minimum. And as I need to notate, I am not a psychologist, so take what I say with a grain of salt here. But it sure seems like Berg created this group with his own history and his own trauma in mind. I'm not sure if it was ever really about being a Christian so much as it was creating a giant family that adored him, worshiped him, and created a world that made his nightmares normal. All Berg really did was create a new cycle of horrific abuse. And this doesn't even begin to account for how anti-Semitic he also was and the other slew of abuse accusations. He was just a very broken, bitter, vile little man. But where was Berg? Where was he to take accountability for all of this? Well, dead, unfortunately. And I only say unfortunately, because I truly wish he could have at least spent a few decades rotting in prison to give his victims some sort of vindication. But. Berg passed away in 1994, just as so many of these revelations came to light, be it the documentary, articles, and even the legal action against the family itself. A judge demanded that the group cease using corporal punishment, but that was basically it. The same thing has happened in other countries too. They've been acquitted in 11 investigations in Argentina, and despite drug charges even being levied against members of the family, along with concealment of persons, involuntary servitude, and a whole slew of other serious offenses, the group just can't be stomped out. Those that didn't overdose after Berg's widow took over, as dozens of them seemingly did, they completely deluded themselves into believing that nothing bad actually happened ever. The spokesman of the family in 1994, Solomon, had the nerve to play dumb in front of the camera at the end of the documentary, even going so far as to say that the Padillas weren't actually a big part of the community whatsoever. And it's funny that he says that because why did Berg publish Mo letters in which he slept with Shelley? Also, Solomon denies any pornographic videos of young kids being sent to Berg. But again, if that's true, then why the fuck were clips of very young Children of God members stripping featured within the documentary? Like, there's proof of this. Why do you lie when the truth is literally staring at you? But he goes on to literally state in plain black and white that pornography has never been produced by the cult. But again, there's so much evidence that they have. These videos were dedicated to David Berg himself. So if their spokesperson really has no knowledge these videos exist, then he either has an even lower IQ than the wooden chair he's sitting in in the video, or he's in complete and utter denial. I understand that to an extent, Solomon has probably been brainwashed into believing this himself. However, even if that's the case, I find it so incredibly difficult to watch this grown man blatantly lie to a camera and say he has no idea if the abuse took place or not. Besides, try as Solomon might to deny what the Padillas say, I'd love to see him try to skirt around the accusations that have come out in even more recent years. For example, when Derek Lincoln was arrested in 2020 for using his senior role in Children of God to rape girls, did that really have nothing to do with the Children of God? Was he just asking children to share their bodies in a godly, spiritual way? And when previous members stepped forward in 2018 calling it hell on earth, were they all not actually real members, just like the Padillas? 
And when Faith spoke on NPR two years ago, was she also lying? Can you honestly say that you'd know what happened better than Berg's own granddaughter? Because I don't think so. Honestly, just fuck the people that minimize this as some kind of spiritual sharing or anything less than what it was, which is a cult surrounded by pedophilia themes. There's nothing more to it than that. And yes, at its core, I do believe that was their message. And frankly, I don't give a shit if like their new organization, the Family International, I don't care what they're about today. This is their history and they have just never wanted to really deal with it. They just tried to ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist. And so since they refuse to apologize, acknowledge, and then actually try to make some kind of reparations and move forward, fuck them as a whole. With this as their history, my belief is that it should be all burned down to the ground. Get rid of it, get rid of Berg's legacy for good. But with all of that being said, those are just my opinions, my thoughts, and the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you made it all the way to the end, I really do appreciate it. I know sometimes these episodes do get pretty graphic and horrific, and today is most certainly one of them. So thank you for joining me to the end of today's episode. If you did make it, I do really appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.